This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on Africa News Tonight... What is happening? We are under attack constantly, as I told you. And we have families that are hanging away from these attacks that need support. That's Lawrence Kanyuka, spokesman for the M23 rebels in the eastern DRC on a ceasefire deal. Details coming up. Also, ECOWAS has agreed to set up a regional peacekeeping force to fight terrorism. The UN Refugee Agency is alarmed at an escalating conflict in South Sudan's Upper Nile State. And an influential opposition leader in Senegal was questioned in court today. We'll have these stories and more on African News Tonight. Our top story, the economic community of West African states ECOWAS agreed this week to establish a regional peacekeeping force to fight terrorism and restore democracy after military coups. ECOWAS defense chiefs will discuss details of the proposed West African force next year, including what powers it would be granted. Analysts and activists have welcomed the idea of a regional security force, though they note several challenges it must overcome to be effective. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria, where ECOWAS is headquartered. West African leaders agreed to establish the regional peacekeeping force at a summit of ECOWAS countries on Sunday. The ECOWAS standby force will be led by chiefs of defense staff of member nations with the stated aim of addressing terrorism and coup attempts among ECOWAS members. The force will also help restore democratic order in places where coups already have taken place. Abuja-based political analyst Rotimio Lawali says the peacekeeping force is a welcome development. ECOWAS is not unfamiliar with uh, creating peacekeeping forces. Uh, in the 90s, uh, ECOWAS is famous for creating ECOMOG, which uh, was responsible for restoring uh, peace and order in a number of countries, including in uh, famous being in Liberia. It's a welcome development, especially, particularly in response to the uh, security challenge to counter violent extremism that we are seeing growing uh, in parts of Western Africa. And what I feel might pose a challenge is uh, uh, this peacekeeping force is expected to respond to two twin challenges. The 15-member West African bloc has seen many coups in the last two years, including ones in Mali and Guinea, and two this year in Burkina Faso. The three countries have been suspended from ECOWAS decision-making bodies, ECOWAS leaders say the coups have set back decades of democratic gains made in the region and have earned it a reputation for being unstable. ECOWAS member nations also are battling jihadist fighters operating across borders, making it difficult for individual nations' security forces to address. Security analyst and editor-in-chief of Security Digest newspapers, Chidi Omeja says, there will be initial challenges. These are purely uh, unconventional kind of warfare, you know. So it's difficult to. You don't even know. You don't even know the the, the, the boundaries, the borders of this conflict. You don't even know who your adversaries are. So how will such standard force be able to identify you know, adversaries? You have the the anglophone. You have the francophone. Uh, the, of course, you know that these two these two um, these two blocks uh, always have these. This, uh, this mutual suspicion among each other. They have different perspectives in terms of the way they deal with each other. Olawali says restoring peace and order will not be easy. There were cases where uh, the sitting government in some of these countries also thwarted their constitution to extend uh, the uh, term of office of, of the incumbent. Public opinion in the country, in, in some of the countries, uh, support you of efforts to have a fresh start. So I feel ECOWAS needs to be very careful in how it responds to um, coups. But I, I think it would run into a lot of problems if there's no public buying, especially by the citizens of the country. This week, the West African bloc told Mali's ruling junta to free 46 Ivorian troops who were sent to provide backup for the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali, but have been held since July. 
Defense chiefs from member nations of ECOWAS will meet in January to discuss a way forward for the peacekeeping force. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Officials from the UN Refugee Agency are expressing alarm at an escalating conflict in South Sudan's Upper Nile state. The conflict has displaced some 20,000 people since August and caused thousands more to flee for safety to neighboring Sudan. Lisa Schlein reports from Geneva. Opposition forces in South Sudan have largely adhered to the 2018 peace agreement, which ended the civil war that began in late 2013. A constant level of intercommunal subnational violence has pervaded the country since then, but none has erupted into a pitched battle. The UNHCR's representative in South Sudan, Arafat Jamal, says the nature of the armed conflict that erupted in the village of Tonga in Upper Nile on August 15th is different. He says it is more alarming than any of the preceding skirmishes. He tells VOA the current conflict has taken on a much more serious tone. He says a hardening along ethnic lines and a greater level of belligerence in the rhetoric are of great concern. And we are seeing a near complete absence of power in at the state level. So very alarming in terms of the ethnic tone, uh, in terms of the seeming apparent lack of, uh, of, uh, of a state apparatus to put, con- to put control on it and a widening geographical um, spread of the violence as well. He notes that violence now covers Upper Nile, Jongle, and Unity State, and has driven some 5,000 people across the border into Sudan. This, he says, is further intensifying South Sudan's refugee crisis, the largest in Africa. The UNHCR reports women and children and others at high risk make up the majority of the displaced. It says fleeing civilians are visibly traumatized. Survivors report killings, injuries, and myriad abuse, including gender-based violence, abductions, and extortion. Jamal says civilians are under deliberate attack in this ruthless conflict. What I have seen with my own eyes in two two trips uh, to Upper Nile in the last six weeks is what appears to be a very apparent um, use of violence against civilian targets, that the, uh, that the attacks were not against military targets. They were against people's houses, they were against clinics, uh, and, it was, um, and, it, and it appeared to be a, an almost wanton destruction. He says the UNHCR and partners are providing shelter, food, relief items, protection services, cash, and other assistance to the most vulnerable, including in hard-to-reach areas. Because of a severe funding shortfall, he warns the UNHCR will not be able to keep pace with the surging needs of those victimized by the escalating violence. He notes just 46% of the $214.8 million needed this year has been been received. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. The rainy season has come and some residents of Harare have taken to urban farming. It's their way of fending off food insecurity that in recent years also has been affecting Zimbabwe's urban population. Like any venture, it comes with its own set of challenges. Reporter Kuzazanoashi has the details. Abigail Tasaranaro is a Harare resident who has been practicing urban farming for the second year this time. She says her family often keeps the harvest for sustenance but sells the excess yield to buy meat and other goods. The produce often lasts the family for about six to seven months but leaves them stranded for the remaining months until they are able to farm and harvest again. She says this is because they only have very small pieces of land to grow food. Often, urban farmers in Zimbabwe grow maize and sweet potatoes. Maize is harvested, dried and processed to make maize meal, which is the key ingredient for Zimbabwe's staple food, sadza. Sweet potatoes are used for breakfast and often go with tea. The choice of the two crops ensures a family can have at least two meals per day. Mary Tutu is a young Zimbabwean in Harare who has taken up urban farming. She says it is not by choice. 
we have no forms of formal employment and this is the only way we make ends meet and we have problems various problems such as monkeys and we have the council on our necks because the plot of lands we're using are not legalized so we have problems of the council and we have wetlands which is never very profitable for us cultivating a wetland requires more fertilizer which eats into the expected profits the harare city council has been cracking down on urban farmers by uprooting their crops. Innocent Ruende is the spokesperson for the Harare City Council. Our bylaws do not allow urban farming on the sides of roads, ridges and wetlands along stream banks as well as river banks. Uh, stream bank cultivation is a serious environmental challenge affecting water borders in the country. The city will rain in on those who are violating city bylaws by removing their crops. We've also put in place measures to regulate urban farming. Urban farmer Jafet Samurio says when the council responds by uprooting their crops, it leaves them unable to fend for their families. He says... The council ought to be more sensitive to the food situation in the country. Urban farming is widespread in other urban centers beyond Harare. While there are no statistics as to how many urban farmers there is in Zimbabwe or Harare, experts say the rising cost of living, inflation, which has eroded people's incomes, as well as the Russia-Ukraine war-inspired fuel rise, are some of the key drivers behind urban farming. Zimbabwe is currently in the lean season, where the food insecure are most affected, and reports say about 3.8 million of Zimbabwe's population will be food insecure during this period. For VOA, this is Kudzai Zinavashe from Harare. An influential opposition leader in Senegal was questioned in court today. The French news agency AFP says Osman Sonko has been accused of rape by I.G. Sar, an employee of a beauty salon where he went for a massage. Sonko denies the charges. Each side accused the other of refusing to answer questions by an investigating judge. Sonko, who came in third in the country's presidential elections three years ago, says the accusations are a plot to destroy his candidacy in 2024. The government denies it's behind the charges. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. Next week, dozens of leaders from African, African nations will be in Washington for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. A few days ago, my colleague Vincent McCory sat down with Dana Banks, special assistant to the president and chair of the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. This is the final of the three-part series on the goals of the summit and the major issues facing the U.S. relationships with African governments. And they start, they started by talking about President Joe Biden's Africa strategy and how it differs from previous administrations. I think um, each administration, there was also a strategy um, that was developed in, in the previous administration, um, sort of a breakout from the uh, national, overall national security strategy. And so most pr- um, recent administ- U.S. administrations have developed their own uh, strategy or a standalone strategy um, towards Africa because, again, the importance of the continent, not just to any one administration, but to the United States. Um, so uh, I think maybe one word to describe it is um, just an elevation and a realization of where we are now in 2022 and the challenges we face and the even more critical role that the continent will play in shaping how we deal with these challenges. Hmm. Now, uh, you cannot talk about this without, uh, not, uh, without mentioning China to some degree. Many people remember that China also does invite African leaders uh, to Beijing. Now, some know and experts say China, of course, is doing its best. Hmm to become the preeminent uh, global uh, power uh, and it's enlisting African countries to kind of enable it to get this stature. The question is, how is the United States countering this? This summit is not a counter to China. This summit is about our relationship Mm -hmm. with the continent. Obviously, there are 
uh, challenges that I mentioned where, um, where global events do come into play, such as Russia's uh, aggression towards Ukraine and the impact that that has caused on uh, wheat exports getting to the continent. Um, so what we are going to discuss is how those, uh, those types of events have a direct impact on our African partners and, again, where they would like for us to help meet them to perhaps you know, increase agricultural yeah. production across uh, the continent so that there is not as great a reliance on uh, imports from other countries and they're not as yeah. vulnerable to that. But, but quickly, you know, some say uh, China's uh, kind of uh, institutionalized its uh, mm-hmm. uh, policy towards Africa in their system and uh, because they have kind of a long-term um, kind of a strategy, the United States seems to, things change every few years because of elections, a democratic system. How does that challenge the engagement of the U.S. with Africa in a consistent way? Well, our administrations change, administrations on the continent change, but what doesn't change um, are the very real realities that we are facing globally. Uh, As we sit here and it's December 1st and we commemorate World AIDS Day, the partnership that was forged under uh, the Bush administration uh, and the the program that was rolled out that we all know today as PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, that we are uh, marking its uh, 20th anniversary, and the lives that were saved across the continent, really our relationship um, with the continent goes back those 20 mm-hmm. years and even far greater with cultural exchanges, with the Fulbright program, mm-hmm. uh, with the Peace Corps program. Do you know how many uh, members of government and business that I've met on the continent said, you know, I was taught by a Peace Corps volunteer um, in my mm-hmm. community. So our relationship, the United States relationship with the continent endures. Uh, this summit is not an effort to compete. It's an effort to meet the moment with Um, our African partners to map out a strategy for how uh, to address those in the future and also how to, again, you know, realize and harness the opportunities. That was Dana Banks, the U.S. chair for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. She was speaking with Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory. For more on the summit, please take a look at voaafrica.com and stay tuned to all your favorite VOA programs for coverage. The Democratic Republic of Congo rebel group M23 says it will withdraw from territory it seized in the past year of fighting the Congolese army and respect a recently declared ceasefire. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's African News Center in Nairobi, Kenya. The M23 rebel group says it is withdrawing from positions in North Kivu province, the epicenter of the fighting that continually troubles the eastern DRC. An M23 spokesman, Lawrence Kanyuka, says the areas under its control are constantly attacked by militia groups and government forces. He says East Africa regional forces need to follow up on their proposal to give peace a chance. We can withdraw, but we want to have a meeting. We have invited the, the force, East African force, and the joint verifications mechanism to come to have a meeting with us in a way to see the modality and the implementation of the said withdrawal. At the same time, I told you as well, we have requested a meeting with the facilitation and the mediators. And the same time as well, in that dialogue with the DRC government. Fighting has raged in North and South Kivu, despite recent ceasefire declarations signed in Angola and Kenya. There was no immediate government reaction to the M23 statement. The rebel group has not been invited to recurring peace talks in Nairobi and authorities in Kinshasa have been reluctant to engage with the rebel group since a previous ceasefire agreement in 2013 failed. The East African Community Regional Bloc has thousands of troops deployed in eastern DRC attempting to call the conflict there and disarm scores of armed groups. The force commanders say they were targeting more than 130 armed groups in the region. Kenyuka says people have been fleeing to M23 controlled areas to seek refuge from government forces. What is happening? We are under attack constantly, as I told you. And we have families that are running away from these attacks that need support because they are living in entities that belong to us in the moment. And we want them to actually be looked after, like those who run away as well in the side of the government uh, control areas. So this is a human people. 
these are actually lives that need to be saved. So the most important things in the present time is to cater for them and to get some some support for them and family. The conflict in eastern Congo between the Congolese forces and the M23 has an ethnic component. The rebel group says it is protecting Tutsi minority tribes that are killed and displaced in the region. With the election just a year away, some experts say President Felix Shisekedi is trading carefully about how he deals with armed groups for fear of losing voters. Mohamed Yesu for VA News, Nairobi. And now for World Cup highlights with VOA's Sunny Young. Welcome to African News Tonight, Sunny. Sporty World Cup greetings, Yeheus. Great to be back on African News Tonight. So all the victors are now resting and preparing for the next stage. And FIFA President Gianni Infantino today hailed the World Cup group stage in Qatar as the best ever. What say you? That's uh... Yeah, uh, uh, I did listen to Infantino's comments, Yeheus, uh among them, among his remarks, uh, which definitely caught my ear, my ears, I should say. <laughs> Infantino, Infantino said uh, more than 2 billion, 2 billion people have watched uh, some of the World Cup. Uh, and, of course, I, I got to believe uh, a, lo- a lot of people have listened to the World Cup. Uh, those that might not have access to televisions. But I, I think from a viewing and listening standpoint, Yeheus, uh this World Cup has been a huge success. Uh, Infantino, the FIFA president, uh, mentioned some of the surprises uh, during the group stage, uh, including Saudi Arabia's upset of Argentina, uh, which I think was the biggest upset uh, during the group stage. And, I, I got to tell you, yeah, hey, I'm really looking forward to watching uh, Lionel Messi in Argentina on Friday when they play their quarterfinal against the Netherlands. That should be a great match. How about uh, Guncalo Ramos from Portugal? Is a new star born? I, uh, I, I think <laughs> so, yeah, hey, uh, Ramos, uh, first player to record a hat trick. Uh, three goals at the World Cup in the round of 16 since 1990. So we got to go back more than 30 years since a player did what he did. Uh, and I know Cristiano Ronaldo was on the sidelines as Ramos was delivering that hat trick. But yeah, I think we're. I think Morocco definitely uh, will be watching Ramos uh, on, on uh, Saturday. Yeah. Hey, uh, He'll, he'll be a player they'll be marking closely. Uh, and I got I to gotta give another shout-out for the Atlas Lions of Morocco, Yeheus. Uh, they, are, they are the surprise team in the quarterfinals. Uh, first Arab nation to Arab-speaking uh, nation to make it to the round of eight, the last eight. And they're the fourth African team to make it to the quarterfinals. And I think they have a lot of support, Yeheus not just in the Middle East, uh, but all over the world. I think the Atlas Lions have really captured the imaginations of, of so many football lovers. They have like two continents, the, the Middle East as well as Africa behind them. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and they even have supporters uh, in the USA and Europe. Uh, Morocco has, has, a, has a big following, I think, uh, in Europe. Uh, one of their best players, uh, Hakimi, he made the final penalty kick for the Atlas Lions. Uh, he was born in Spain, and some of the other Moroccan players have ties to Europe. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're going to really yes. be closely watched in this quarterfinal stage. Just a reminder for our African News Tonight listeners, no African team has ever made it past the quarterfinal stage at a World Cup. So I would love to see the Atlas Lions make it to the semifinals and maybe even the final, Yehia. Go, Morocco. Thank you, Sonny, for <laughs> your input. <laughs> Thank you, Yehia. 
And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehei Yusuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Barrow, and our engineer, Nelson Lopes, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.